2017. And so that's the challenge that as the economy is growing by seven, on average, you know, 5 percent in 2017, the economy is growing by seven, on average, you know, 5 percent every year between 2008 and 2017. Lending to the private sector has actually declined, right? So, um, as an entrepreneur and somebody who also sells sells capital to to businesses, I kind of relate very closely to this because access to finance is extremely difficult in our markets, and it's it's been much much more um, it's it's been harder in the in the last few years. There's been quite a few, I guess down the road we'll talk about it, there's been quite a few alternatives to financing that mostly public sector players are trying to infuse into the system, but we need a bit more sort of push. We need momentum to be able to drive that capital for businesses, particularly um, businesses in Ghana, because we're an SME economy. SME meaning that most of the companies that do anything meaningful, right, are below $100 million. Whereas, you know, in developed countries, you can easily raise a billion dollars and they still think they are small businesses. And so that's where the focus should be on that. How do we touch the mom and pop entrepreneurs? How do we provide capital? How do we access to capital to make it easy for mom and pop entrepreneurs, people who employ um, zero to 10 people to work for them just so they can grow to become industry captains that we mentioned earlier on in some of the panels this morning. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian. Let me go to um, um, Dr. Pente. Now, you um, co-authored a book, um, Enterprise Map of Ghana, where you did a research on various, especially SMEs, their challenges and all that. During that research, what are some of the key things you realize with um, SMEs getting access to credit?
Okay. Uh, yes, but let me bring in Dr. Summers because what you've said is really worrying. Um, Dr. Billions of CDs being taken by um, public uh, serv uh, service, private sector has no chance to take this because everything is going to treasury bills, etc. I mean, how can we change this narrative to, to help the private sector? To, ch to cook the books. <laughs> Okay, so since we have the businesses here and some of your submissions, it shows that you can't fully blame the banks, the financial institutions and government, but some of the issues have to do with uh, businesses themselves. Are they keeping the right records? Are they put in, ensuring that um, when they get the loans, they pay back all that? Let's touch on these issues. So um, businesses here now understand the need for them to do the right thing. So I'm going to start with you, uh, Dr. Quente, on that. Thank you very much. And before I touch on that, I think one of the things I want to mention is that access to credit is getting more difficult. And it will get increasingly difficult because the world's financial system is having problems. Individual countries are having problems. So it's increasingly getting very difficult to 
get mainstream funding for businesses. The other thing is that when we talk about the problem of accessing credit as an SME, it's not only a Ghanaian problem. It's not a problem of Africa. Okay. It's not only a problem of uh, emerging or frontier economy. It's a problem globally. So even if you go to the US today, SMEs are struggling to get funding. So I, I give an example. About 70% globally, about 16 to 70% of SMEs never get access to credit. About 70%? About 70%, 60 to 70%. Globally? Globally. You know now, what? I made a promise to them that at the end of the day, they'll get access to credit. Exactly. What so, you're saying, you're putting me in trouble. No, no. We will come back to that because we need to, we need to now appreciate what we have to do to be different. Okay. Now, interestingly, individual countries have taken steps and they're moving away from that. So they can say that 70%, 80% of our SMEs can get access to credit. Otherwise, if you don't do anything about it as a country, then you're going to continue to have bigger problems. You know, as an SME, I think one of the things you need to do is record keeping. Record keeping. It's so increasingly very difficult to get information on SMEs in our part of the world. And of course, because of what we do, we engage SMEs a lot, and very often you run into problems of getting information. I think the other thing has got to do with you as an individual and your lifestyle. And today, I'm sure you remember um, some experience was shared in terms of how cultural you know, practices and, of course, uh, the things we do can kill our businesses. Mm -hmm. When you decide to be an entrepreneur, it's a long haul. There are no short-term benefits. There are decisions you take today that can kill your business. So the businesses that we see continuously operating and struggling to weather the storm and move on are companies driven by people who are looking well into the long term. So you have to be very careful in terms of financial prudence, things you cannot do. It's very difficult to, be, to have an SME and be driving very expensive vehicles. <laughs> it's because the cash you need to run the business cannot service that vehicle. So it's important to keep the business running and focus more on the profit but not your capital. You can also use your business money to buy land. But it's a good asset, they'll say, isn't so it? So this is what I would say. If you grow your business, you're going to get to a point where you can buy a house without any problems. But in the early stage, when you buy land, land is not going to generate returns. It will appreciate in value, but your business can potentially run into you know, problems. And the reason also is this. The banks want you to show some collateral. Yes. So when you start your business, instead of focusing on your cash flow, because cash is everything. You know, so the most important thing you need to do is to focus on how to retain cash to keep your business going. Um, we've had a lot of instances where uh, SMEs have to go beyond themselves, the banks, and then borrow at very high cost because the banks are not giving money. And sometimes you're under a lot of pressure, and then you borrow at 8 10% outside the mainstream banks when you deal with the finance houses. How can you run a business and then pay interest of 60 80 120% per annum and survive. You virtually will be enslaved and you'll be working for that institution. Now, I don't have the answers to that because when somebody is running a business, that person is passionate. You really want to keep their business going. Their life dependent on you. You need to pay your bills and all that. So when there are no options, you end up doing that. But it has to be very calculated because once you begin to go for very expensive money, then you'll be walking a, a thin line. It doesn't take long for you to sleep you know, down the slope because once you can't service the facility, you're going to be in trouble. So a lot of it has, could, has to do with the behavior of the entrepreneur. And I want to add, my last point will be what I will call governance. It's important to have people on your board who can check you as the business owner. Because quite often, when you don't have that control, then your business becomes more like the residence. You know, you're running your home and then your business from the same pocket. And if you are not very careful, you will begin to incur costs that the business cannot sustain. So it's important to have governance in place. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 the governance system should be strong. Have people on your board who can help you 
to grow your business. At this point, I think that's really yeah. what I'll say for okay. now. Thank you. I'll stick with the issue of corporate governance because even if you look at the financial sector crisis, corporate governance was a big thing. You expect that some of the well-structured companies will you know, respect the corporate governance rules, but they were not. I mean, so if those big companies were, had board members who were just stooges, who were just flouting the laws, cooking the books, etc., how easy or difficult is it for the SMEs who probably two-month business can't afford to have a whole board, can't afford to have people in checks and balances, can't have, afford to have a proper accountant do the books. Go by these rules realistically. That, that can go to any of you. Yeah, that's a difficult one. But what I would say is that, you know, we used to live in a, a certain environment where we said it is too big to fail. But companies like Enron, which was a major company in the world, failed because of governance issues. So if you take that for granted, you run into problems. What I would say is that, the SMEs we have today are quite different from the SME we used to have in the past, where a couple of years ago you have SME and the two board members are man and wife, and the decisions are made in the board, in the, you know, board decisions are made at home and all that. Now you see very progressive SMEs, where because the entrepreneurs, the owners are focused on growing the business, becoming mega players locally and internationally, they have very strong board. So obviously you expect big company to misbehave in some instances, but serious SMEs have changed, and you see new uh, companies, startups, with very strong board because the owners are really determined to make a mark. So we can't take that for granted. We, ha we don't have the answers, but my point is that if you want to grow as an SME, you want to be sustainable and make an impact in the sector you're in locally, internationally, then you need a good board in place. At least it's better to have that than not have it at all. Okay, yeah. so we've seen some of the things we are doing wrongly and all that, our challenges and all that. Let's go to positioning. How do they position themselves well to attract the right funding? We'll go to the different types of funding because obviously it's not just the banks. There are various places you can go to to get funding and at a good rate and all that. But let's start with positioning. I am struggling to get funds. How do I position myself properly, Dr. Mensa? Mm -hmm. Well, Positioning really means that you have to do all the right things. I think some of them have been mentioned already, like uh, setting up your corporate governance, uh, using best practices, um, keeping your accounts properly, keeping records properly, having a good understanding of what your capital, your financing needs really are. I mean, a lot of times, Everybody is running to the bank. But see, banks by their nature are not designed to give startup capital. If you want startup capital, it has to come from your own pocket or from some other um, source, such as, in some cases, venture capital and so forth. But you cannot go to a bank with zero equity and then ask the bank to finance your business for you. Because banks, by their nature, are not designed. They give loans. They don't give, they don't give equity. They give loans. And loans are usually very short term. OK, three months, six months, one year. But when you start up, you need permanent capital, capital that is not in a hurry. So you, if you're positioning yourself, you have to make sure that you have positioned yourself in terms of the, the infusion of your own resources into the business and not expect the bank to be able to finance uh, you with a loan because initially you don't really have collateral and banks are not going to lend you money on that basis. So there are many things that you can do to position up yourself. One is starting with your own equity and making sure you put in equity of your own, keep proper records, have a, a respectable board with sound gov corporate governan governance practices and then continuously, you know, upgrade your, 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 your personnel, upgrade your products, and so forth. Okay. Right. I can complement this, uh, the responses with an example that um, there's a company that listed recently on the New York Stock Exchange. It's called Beyond Beggar. And it was started by a bunch of food scientist, you know, you have your 
David's, Brian, your Hillary, that came together to start a business. And um, now it's one of, it's a multi-billion company. What it does is that it creates a beef burger that tastes like beef from vegetables, a combination of soy, coconut oil, etc. right? It was a science that these people built the company, but it just so happened that uh, they were in an environment that fostered entrepreneurship. And so environment is very important, that the company garnered money from friends and family, they've got Series A, Series B capital, equity capital that they were talking about, and then were able to get private equity to put in money, and then the private equity supported them to go to the capital markets. I think we, as much as the SME entrepreneur has to provide all these elements to be able to access capital, there need to be public sector support in both technical assistance, because we are a growing economy that needs to sort of provide knowledge, education, et cetera, to entrepreneurs on how to grow their businesses. Otherwise, there will always be this tension between entrepreneurs not figuring out how to access you know, bank loans because that's the only type of form of loan we, we know, and then banks waiting to provide capital, but then um, they can't find the right businesses to support. But I've seen over time that countries like Ghana is, is, is trying to make an effort. We, sat, we started with a um, venture, capi venture capital trust fund, but over time it hasn't been you know, properly seeded. We have national board for small scale industries, which is really some, you know, an institution that supports entrepreneurs both from the rural communities as well as from our city. So we need to fund some of these institutions to provide the, the level of support that SMEs need to prepare themselves and access funding. There's also other innovative financing like guarantees. I mean, Exim Bank, et cetera, is providing that 8% to 12% financing for businesses, which is about, it's a subsidized financing, just so entrepreneurs in the value addition sector can provide, can be able to access capital, the right amount of capital to build the industries, employ, pick up the raw materials that our farmers are, um, are generating to convert them into, into products. So as much as the SMEs are required to be, you know, as perfect, and I mean, not all of us, some of us, I mean, a lot of the SMEs want to, want to improve, they just don't know, they just don't have the know-how, we need to have a, a strong public arm that can build an app just so private sector investors, international investors, pension funds, etc., can also begin to look at them in the manner in which this Beyond Burger company started from nowhere almost a decade ago to you know, multiples of billion dollar company. Okay, so let's now um, look at the options available to us apart from the banks which it appears like Dr. Sam said, they are not looking for the startups, they are looking for, you know, those who have gotten all there. But most of us are startups or mid-level and all that. Let's, I think there are about five or six options available or more. If we can go through these options, because most people here want to know those options and, and go for them. So let's start with you, Dr. Sam. Give us some of the options available realistically that they can deal with them. The other two gentlemen will also come in. Well, unfortunately, our, our financial system is such that um, the options are not that many. I don't think the bank is always the best place to go for capital, as I said earlier. Um, government has realized that, you know, it's difficult to, for SMEs to get the support they need from banks and therefore has set up a number of schemes. I call them schemes. One of them is Exim Bank, for example, which is a, it's a government scheme. It's not a bank. It's, it's a bank nominally, but it's a government scheme. Doc, if you, you can raise your yes, thank yeah, you. It's a government scheme to provide alternatives. So at Exim Bank, the interest rate is lower than what you can get by going to a bank. And then importantly, you can get a longer, a much longer term loan or facility than you would get from a bank. There's a major lack of 
long-term financing. And even if you are successful in getting a loan from a bank, it will be like one year, two years. But some of the schemes that have been set by government, like EXIM, for example, would go, I don't know, five years, sometimes longer. And so that's one area. Move or start to think about alternatives. The second alternative we had, which was just mentioned, was the, is the Venture Capital Trust Fund, which I think is being reorganized. Because venture capital, uh, by definition, does not really provide, it rides on providing equity, not loans. And as I said, as a startup, what you need is equity, not loans. And therefore, Venture Capital Trust Fund is another alternative when I think that if it's uh, reorganized, it will be a good source of financing for uh, SMEs. We also mentioned the uh, NBSSI. NBSSI has been there for many, many years, and I really don't think a lot of businesses have taken advantage of what it can offer. M NBSSI actually prepares you to access funding. They prepare you by helping you to keep your records, helping you with management advice, um, marketing, input and so forth. And so we have to start to think about non-bank forms of finance, which in many situations will be much more effective than going to a bank. Okay. All right, um, thank you. I have about three suggestions, and then I have one which has got to do with policy. Um, let me start with the one on policy. And of course, for us to understand the importance of SMEs to an economy, generally, SMEs will be contributing between 50 and 60 percent to GDP, and that is in Africa. So on the average, if you take any African country, SMEs will be up to about 80 percent of registered businesses. So when we talk about their contribution to GDP, it will be 50 to 60 percent. And secondly, they generate employment up to about 60 percent of the working population. So what countries have done is to infuse SME development into their policy development agenda so that if your country is doing well, the understanding is that your SME sector is doing very well. I think what we've done in Ghana over the years, we've spoken a lot about SME, we've set up institutions, but they are not strong. So let me give you an example. In Malaysia, in 1996, they set up an SME development entity. It's called the SME Development Corporation. And the essence of that entity was to use SME as a basis for wealth creation and also for social well-being. Now, what it had done over the years, you think about between 1996 up to 2016, the SME Development Board had granted guarantees for almost half a million SMEs. And the amount of money involved over the period is about 15 billion US dollars. So until you take such bold steps, it becomes very difficult for the SME sector to grow. So what they've done is that they provide guarantees for the SMEs to go to financial institutions to get loans. Now, once you do that, the financial institution, because they are not taking the risk, can give very competitive interest rate. And their reason is very simple. Even if some of them fails, we benefit from the growth in the economy. So Malaysia's economy has been very robust. With all the financial crises and all the difficulties economies have had, we never heard of Malaysia yeah. because they've sustained growth in that sector. They also have a venture capital trust fund. In 2016... Before you go to the other ones, why are we finding it difficult to set these? We have the yeas and the, all those new ones that are coming up. Previous governments had similar ones. Say, it's still the same story. Yeah, my thing is that it's a strong policy decision you need to take. Because if you want to grow your economy, you think about Ghana. If we take out the oil sector, we're doing well, but we could do far better if SMEs were growing. I mean, it's too difficult from the discussion that we've had today. It's exceptionally difficult to run a business in Ghana. If you're an SME, you're in big trouble. So as a government, you need to take bold decisions. So let's take NBSSI, for instance. Mm -hmm. If you're an entrepreneur, you're a young guy, you, you have a startup, especially if you're in the tech sector or digital sector, and you visit 
uh, any of the NBSSI offices, you'll be discouraged, seriously under-resourced. So they know what they have to do, but as a government, you know, we haven't really taken a bold step to resource them to respond to the needs of the current environment, because things have changed. The SMUs of today are different, totally different from the SMUs of a couple of years ago. These are smart people who know where they want to be. NBSS, I don't know whether the website is working very efficiently, but you have <laughs> a startup with a very good website, and you, you're trying to interact with NBSS and the question is, what should you be doing? And I'll give another example. Once you have that policy in place, an entity like Venture Capital Trust Fund should be resolved. Seriously, Venture Capital Trust Fund was set up, if I'm correct, in 2004. If we look at the number of transactions they've done, seriously under resourced. So they haven't done much. In Malaysia, they also set up a Venture Capital Trust Fund. In 2016 alone, the amount of money they gave, or the amount of investment, because they give equity into startups and SMEs was 1.5 billion US dollars in one year. I don't think over the past 15 years or so of our venture capital trust fund we've done anything close to over well, the whole period. Is it a good idea for them to also to go to these venture capital and NBSSI? If I mean, it doesn't okay. Look so this is what I would say: <laughs> we need to learn from what works. We need to go and then see what is it that they are doing differently. Learn now. You don't want to take what they've done and then plant here 100% you want to take the co context into consideration. So we are a different country, but learn in terms of what they have done. So if from a policy point of view, we come out with SME development policy and we decide to work it, we need to strengthen the organization, the institution that have to do the implementation. Okay. Hold on with your thought. I think yes. Dr. Mensa wants to chip in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, uh, we always say that institutions are to be resourced, but that applies across the board in Ghana. Every institution, we want every institution to be better resourced. And where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> so that the, the money that is there, we say, but a lot of corruption and all that is pulling out this money. Well, well yeah. So the money is gone in different directions, <laughs> yes. including corruption. Yes. So the the I think our our solutions should start with making the institutions that we have work better. Because we don't really, we can't put a lot of resources into these institutions. We have to make them work a little better than they did in the past. For example, Venture Capital Trust Fund. I think we are all, we are all aware of the happenings at Venture Capital Trust Fund. A few years ago, a lot of scandalous stories came out, which means that we didn't really allow, the institution did not work. Initially, it was resourced to start with, but there were people, uh, uh, people who took over and just ruined the institution. So we have to make our institutions work better. And that also includes consistency, policy consistency. You know, we are in a country where when there is a change of government, all the heads of institutions are changed. And it takes another three, four years to get back to what we were doing before. But will that change? It doesn't look like that will change. The reality on the ground is if, if, for example, the other government comes in, it stops whatever the other was doing. It takes out the, the, the uh, officials of the other person. The reality on the ground, that doesn't look like it will change. <laughs> Just like the resource problem. Just like the resource problem. So I even feel more sorry for the SMEs here now. Yeah. <laughs> but let, let's I mean, bring I mean, it, okay. I, I, mean, so I think quickly, um, let me finish then. Um, I think quickly, I want to give some suggestions. I think first and foremost, if you are an SME or you're a startup, I think one of the things you should quickly think about is how to get others to invest with you. We are always in a position where you want to hold 100% of what you started. I think gone are the days, so mergers and acquisitions, quickly think about how to ready yourself to get somebody in. There are entities. A lot of, I'm sure, um, Brian's entity Brian. and all that. They help SMEs. Our entity, we do. There are a whole lot of others in Ghana. That will help you prepare yourself and look for people to put money in. The only thing is this. You will make a difference if you prepare yourself to get an angel investor, for instance. If you don't prepare yourself, your documentation is not done, you are not packaged, you are not branded, it's difficult to make any headway. So one of the things you want to quickly think about is, yes, it's good to have 100%. But think about getting somebody to buy into the company, give us some shares and all that so you can actually work with others. In fact, 
what I've realized is that MNAs are becoming like one of the opportunities for SMEs to get funds to grow. The other one is what I would call, um, they call it invoice factoring. Now, what some countries have done, and I will give you an example, uh, Mexico, they had an issue with SME funding. What they decided to do was to move the risk from the SME to your buyers. Let's say you're an SME, you produce and then supply to big companies. What they have done is that they've established a platform where you, you, you supply and they're going to pay you in 90 days. Immediately you supply, you publish that invoice on a platform. And then your supplier will also publish the invoice they receive from you, get to validate that. Now what had happened is that they started, I think in 2004, if I'm correct, over the years, they have about 40 banks. Every day, somebody goes on that platform and check whether there's a new post of an invoice. So what they do is that they, they will just contact the buyer. If the buyer is a big company, which is known, they say, well, you bought from this person. You're going to supply in, uh, pay in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Is it true? They say, yes. When they validate, they'll make you an offer because they'll shift the risk from you and then take it to the buyer because those are companies that you can identify and validate, and they become very, very successful. They have about 12,000 SMEs on that platform at the moment. They have about 600 big buyers, the companies that the SMEs supply to, because these are large companies in Mexico, and it's working very, very well. It's something we need to think about, because what it does is that the, you begin to have liquidity. You think about an SME where you have to supply, let's assume you're supplying food to a company, You'll be supplying every day for 30 days before you get paid. How are you going to sustain that? But with this new arrangement, if your requirement is daily, you post it. I've sent an invoice, maybe it's 1,000 Ghana, second day, third day. Some banks are ready to discount and give you money instantly because they know they will get the money from um, the buyers. The third one, which is really one of the new things happening in the world today, is what we call crowdfunding. I can tell you one thing. It's worked for SMEs in developed environment and it's working for SMEs in emerging economy. In fact, people use even basic ones. We, we call it a GoFundMe. And people have used, people contribute. Investors go to look for this. And there are about 35 crowdfunding uh, websites in the world today. Any of them could be an opportunity for an SME. But again, you need guidance, you need help. So it's important for us to take advantage of that because that helps you to take so little from so many people, like $2,000, $1,000 and all that, you could easily raise $100,000 over a period once you promise very good return. But the thing is that you have to be a company that has records that they can validate and all that. So you need to keep your records in place, get a good board in place, and you'll be able to. It will not work for everybody, but I can tell you it will be an opportunity for some SMEs in Ghana. Uh, I would say those are the trade that will say potentially we should be considering in terms of how we raise money for our SMEs. Okay, right. Yeah, I would, li I would like to add um, one more platform to the suggestions. Uh, we talked about the policy consistency, so we, I will shift from there. But the idea, the whole idea of listing these alternatives is that we need a system where um, private sector money domestically can be recycled into building new enterprises that are sustainable. And I've seen a trend of accelerators or incubators. These are business develop, you know, developers who help SME from a private sector perspective to incubate their businesses. I think as of end of 2018, there were about 46 of them that have come, you know, that have set up in Ghana. But then the choke again is the resource you know, paradox, which, I th which we could solve. You know, it would take time, but we could solve in the sense that um, I was reading an African report that indicated Ghana is in the top 10 um, destinations or cities or countries for rich people in Africa. We have about 2,900 high net worth individuals who have accumulated $59 billion as to whether it's saved in Ghana, invested in Ghana or elsewhere. We need methods 
to attract that capital to stay in the country. And the way you do that is that, um, I was just chatting with Dr. Mensah, that we need to build a strong trust system where some of these accelerators can tap into and some of these crowd funders can also um, believe in that if you go online and you're able to raise $200,000, you could actually build your company and honestly, even if you lose the, the money by genuinely you know, sort of using the funds for your business, there could be some level of accountability. Part of the problem is that we're so informal in our approach in the way we do things. The informal sector is about 60% of the economy. And so people don't also trust us with handling their money. Um, public sector tries to, government tries to bring in um, methods like digital addresses. But we don't know. I mean, I went to an immigration officer and I showed the digital address and he was confused. He says, "Why well, is that your telephone number? That's too long, <laughs> right? But I mean, we've made, we've made an effort to spend on digital addresses, right? Just so business locations, even Kelly Willis sellers can, be look, can have an address. I will say, I am located close, this is my closest address. When that accountability uh, or when there's an effort that is put in to set up something, and there's no follow through, then it's like the money is half wasted and then all the systems that are put in place to protect or develop the SMEs or the private sector then becomes half-hearted or half-developed. And so that's part of the things that we need to, uh, to think through, that how do we um, create an incentive for private sector money to stay in, in the country? Because foreign investors, I mean, most of my capital comes from outside of Ghana. US, UK, uh, developers, development finance institutions in, um, in, um, in, um, in uh, Netherlands, even the pension fund from South Africa is an investor in a private equity fund. So they look, at, they look at some of these things and say, are your wealthy individuals putting money back? If they are not, if they are taking the money elsewhere, then they want to see where else are they putting the money, just so, just so they, can, they, they, they can chase their return. So, you know, we need to balance that risk and safety of capital. I think we all understand risk. When somebody gives you money, he knows that there's a probability of you losing 100% of their shares. But then if there's not a safety net to protect them as to how they will recover the, the funds or how they can recover the residual money left, then that trust element, right, is taken away to another country because now we've become a global community. If Malaysia is doing better than Ghana, then investors will begin to say, okay, how do I chase some of, how do I get some of the returns in, in Malaysia? So there has to be some dual efforts where, um, you know, public sector is supporting private sector to be able to keep the capital within the country because I'm sure over the past decade, Ghana has generated a lot of millionaires in the country, but we're buying houses out, outside of Ghana. We're buying, you know, investment securities outside of Ghana just because we want to hedge against volatility in our own country. But we need to, you know, make sure that our ecosystem is so robust that investors would be, we can have a net investment coming into, into the country. That can help solve the resource, you know, problem that we have. Okay, so you've mentioned about five options. I'm coming to your option, um, the equity fund. So an SME who wants to tap into that fund, what process will they go through? What kind of scrutiny would you have on this SME before you would consider lending to this person? Okay. We make it a little painful for the SME just because my investors make it painful for me. Mm -hmm. But um, essentially, it's what we've said what we've said um, earlier on this morning, it's more about providing track record of your business. Even if the business is not profitable, we like to see the history of growth. And so we like to see financial statements, who your technical people are, and how have they helped you to get to where you are right now. I'll give you some background. We, have, we currently have about $120 million under management. We invest between two to $10 million per company, so it's still, on the high side for SMEs in Ghana. But we've done eight to nine, we've done about nine countries across Africa. And most of the requirements that we, what we look to do is to do a minimum of 30% in equity, and then the rest of the funding can be in the form of some long-term debt or some restructuring debt, that, some debt that we could restructure into equity over time. 
And so we just look at the market opportunity for some of these businesses. And most of our investment goes into food and agri-value chain, as well as you know, financial inclusion, et cetera. Um, because it's an impact fund, we're looking to make double-digit returns, but that is not our priority. Our priority is to create employment, create jobs, you know, enhance the businesses, as well as make sure that we can sell to another partner who's looking to do the same thing. Um, private equity has been quite, um, it's quite new in, in general. It started in the 70s, 80s around the world. Uh, first PE fund focused on Africa started in, a, in, in, in early 2000s so far. There are about 200 to 300 PE funds looking all across Africa. But those are platforms that could be interesting over the next decade for Africa because it provides alternative source of funding to what the banks could do. And um, the good thing about our business is that we provide technical assistance in addition to the investment that we make. So we're not, prov we're not supplying the capital and sitting on boards and drinking tea every quarter. We look for experts. If you are a pineapple processing company, we will look for a pineapple you know, expert to help you maximum your yield. We'll look for an engineer to make sure that the factory is optimized. We'll look for markets for you if it's um, to develop the local economic systems or if the intention is to export the businesses because we believe that if you make money, we make money. That's how we make money. So if the business loses money, I have to you know, sort of write a report and say we tried, but we couldn't. So we, we try as much as possible to provide these technical assistance, which actually comes alongside investment, but then we, are, we don't expect any returns on the technical assistant. It's meant to supplement the investments to make sure that the environment in which the business functions is actually functioning properly. And so um, as a long-term investment player, we look to stay in the business for about five to seven years, which gives you enough time to build management teams, build your balance sheet, look for the market, and then eventually by year seven, if you're doing well, then we sell. If you're not doing well, we try to stay longer or we just write off the investment. And that's how, you know, that's how the, the PE practice around the world works. Okay. Let me say that we'll open the floor for you to ask specific questions if you have that. I'll do that in a minute or two. But before I do that, let's look at crowdfunding as well, how they can tap into crowdfinancing and some of the other ones we've mentioned so far. Crowdfunding. Crowdfunding. Well, I don't know whether, I don't think we have any crowdfunding platforms in Ghana at this point. But essentially what crowdfunding means is that you invite everybody who's interested to become part of your, your company, but you need a platform on which you can, you can make it happen by giving out information about your company. And there are structures, certain structures have to be in place. You need legal documentation. For example, agreement, you have to have, people have to be, have, have confidence that if they come to put money into your company through a, crowd, a crowdfunding scheme, they'll have up to date. I think you, know, you said all of that already. But we don't have that kind of a platform in Ghana. So maybe um, this is something that, it, it, it's some, I don't know who, who exactly uh, would initiate Maybe you Maybe don't. You should initiate. Platform. It's a private sector opportunity. <laughs> it's a business opportunity. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not even sure that. I think it will take a while because in Ghana we don't trust each other. <laughs> <laughs> we don't trust each other. So it's going to be very. It's going to take a while for something like crowdfunding to catch on, and it's agreement intensive you know I, I think I, I participated in one before you have to sign a lot of a lot of documents has to be completed and so forth so we have a little bit of work to do but clearly I think he said as he said it's an opportunity for for somebody to to do some some good business okay no. okay the, the ones you mentioned how do they tap into them um, what I what I would say is okay this is one of the difficult ones for most SME that have been successful in raising money, especially outside the country, and I'm sure uh, Brian has, has spoken a lot about that, you need to be packaged. And there are entities in Ghana that can help you do that. Um, a lot of consultancies, 
The difficulty SMEs face is that consultancy is not free. You know, so then <laughs> some of the challenges you have is then SMEs are beginning to transfer their challenges to the consultancies, where it's okay, we want you to do this for us, and you know, they don't have money to pay for it, and it becomes very, very difficult. Um, in the past, we used to have a facility called Empretec. Yes. And Empretec was funded by the World Bank Government of Ghana, and what it did was subsidize the rates for this kind of services. And I can name a number of Ghanaian businesses that have grown today because of that facility. So we need to really, and again, come back to policy, where government would take a bold decision and begin to resource, and I use the word resource advisory. In fact, one of the things that has to do with that is capacity development, to make sure the entities have capacity to even handle the new uh, demands of SMEs. So um, the use of services of third parties is important. For instance, if you're going to do crowdfunding, I don't think I can, I can help you do that. I don't know whether you have the expertise, but there are entities that are doing that. And quite recently in Senegal, Dakar, they set up what they call the Africa Crowdfunding Association. And it became very clear that one of the opportunities for SMEs in Ghana to assess funding is to use crowdfunding. So there are a few in Africa, but what I suggest is that there are about 35 known ones globally. And you don't have to be located in those environments to, as long as you can fulfill the demand. A lot of legal documents, they need to check. For instance, a lot of SMEs in Ghana avoid dealing with uh, the tax authorities. I hope you understand that. Now, it will be very difficult for you to deal with those entities if you don't show that at least you pay taxes. It doesn't matter how small. You know, so you need to make sure that your legal documentation is all right. Otherwise, if you don't pay taxes, I tell you, most of these entities will not deal with you because they will think you are not legit. So it's important to do the things you have to do. You have to pay the SNIT contribution of your employees. You don't have to avoid them. So keep record and then show all the legal evidence that you are an entity that has come to stay. If you did that, I'm sure uh, some of them will be ready to help so that uh, the little fund that you need $50,000, $100,000, it's not too difficult to get those kind of monies. One million, two million, it's a bit more intense, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, we all know that. So I see it as an opportunity. Maybe the first SME that will start will be very successful. Immediately they begin to default, they will tighten the screws. They become default for subsequent ones. So um, I believe you've seen third parties would help SMEs okay. in Ghana to achieve, especially if they are ready to at least pay for the cost of the services. Okay. Let me now open uh, the floor for questions. Um, I believe the microphone, it's, um, can you give me a wave if you have the microphone? Okay, so right behind me on my right. So um, let's start with this side. There's a gentleman here who will take his question. I think we should take three at a time, or should we take answer as we go, or take as we go? Okay, so let's take three for starters, answer that, then we'll come back. So let's start with you. Thank you. My name is Jonas Aitevi. Why is Jonas? We can't see. I'm yes. here. Okay. I know sometime in 2013, uh, Ghana Stock Exchange uh, launched this uh, Ghana alternative market to help with SMEs. But I haven't had the panelists talk about that. I don't know if they can throw some light on that for us. And then the second thing, too, is uh, I think we're looking for solutions. And then uh, if I feel it's also a matter of the kind of culture we have in the country, where we don't seem to support our own. I don't see how much an SME will need that family and friends, if they really understand what a person wants to do, could not be in the capacity to help. So if like we have that support system, where if you need about 100,000 to start a business, and you can even raise 50,000 from 20 people in your family or from your friends, I think it will go a long way to help. So if you can encourage family and friends to support us, it will be very wonderful. Thank you so okay. much. Thank but you very much. Let me take this. There's a lady here if we can have. Yes. Hi, good morning. Hi, I'm Hillary. So I'm not sure if it's a question, but I, I feel like there's a lot of doom and gloom here in Ghana in general. I think we can be, I, I think energy is so important. So I'm here and I'm, I'm like, okay, so what are the clear solutions? I hear resource, resource, resource. How are we going to resource these government institutions? We probably don't even have the money for it. 
Secondly, there's so, always so much negative energy when a new policy is being implemented. So for instance, someone mentioned positioning as a company. We need an address, you need a credit bureau. How do you get your address? We have a new digital address. And I remember it being lambasted so much in the public space. So these are things, it might be isolated, but as you realize now, all the dots are connecting. So maybe you might have been like, oh my God, it was such a waste of money to have this digital address system. And now you're realizing that, no, somebody needs to actually be able to locate you. Somebody needs to actually know that you're paying your taxes and doing the right thing. So what are the solutions? We're saying resources as well. So resources, how is go um, government going to resource the NBSSI? So it, we should move beyond the rhetoric of, you know, down in our institutions and down in our policymakers, because whether we like it or not, government is not just who you vote into power, it is us, we are Ghanaians. So what is the way forward? We've heard about crowdfunding, yes. So you're saying MBSSI needs funding, you're saying we have all these institutions, so what's the way forward? It's not enough to come and, you know, lament, or enough to be toxic and vile, what is the way forward? For those institutions that well, are For struggling. all of us, what okay. is the way forward? All right, thanks, Valerie. Um, Hillary. 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 Hillary, sorry. Can we take, uh, no, okay. So let me take the gentleman here and the, the, the jacket, the black jacket. That will be the third, then we'll take the answers and come back. Um, <clears throat> my name is David uh, Fosu. Um, mine is basically a, a plea, basically. It seems to me that all that has been said, the bedrock of everything is politics. Because all the changes that this government is making God willing, if the next government wins, everything will just go back to square one. And we do this every year, to be perfectly honest, right? We need to devoid ourselves from the uh, politics of promises. That can't be fulfilled. And let's just go to the people and say, look, instead of providing you all of this, these are the policies we want to implement and help us to implement it. We've been, we've been in this country where this uh, party comes, promises heaven and earth. They don't do anything and then they leave. Another one comes, oh, this guy did not give you proper promises. I'll give you better promises and will strategically not fulfill them. And in the next eight years, we're going to have the same problem again, which will make all this meeting completely pointless. Um, I'm sorry to be as negative, but sit here in the panel, it's a very grim, grim reality for each, or not, or each one of us sitting here. We can't get fi uh, fin uh, funding to our, uh, for our businesses. And at the end of the day, if our, your family is not well to do or you don't know a lot of contact, well, tough luck. It's very sad. Thank okay. you. Um, I'll take two questions. Questions, then we can come to the comments so that they can answer that. Um, the, the two in the middle, the gentleman who just stood up. My name is Edwin. Doc, I forgot your name, but I want to ask a question. If I want to consult you, how much would it cost me to consult you here? <laughs> That's a fair question. Um, okay, so let me take, um, <laughs> Mr. Ankam is here himself. Let me take his question, the Deputy Trade Minister, then we'll come to, don't worry, we'll take everybody's question, don't worry about that. Uh, Albert, if you can come to, is that Albert? Come to. Thank you. I want to know if I was allowed to answer a question. Or yes, I should just sit are. here and keep quiet. I was told I should. I wanted to answer the question of MBSSI. Uh, the National Bureau of Small Scale Industry is actually going through a major revamp. I'm not sure if that was mentioned earlier, but we turn it into an agency. We are revamping all of MBSSI. They've managed to, managed to identify $4 million for MBSSI to even physically upgrade its physical infrastructure. We are building 74 business resource centers in 74 districts around the country to provide business resource advice for small businesses. These are funded. We got over $120 million from AFDB and Africa, uh, Africa Development Bank. We're also building, I just wanted to give some good news. I was here, when I walked in, everything sounded so dull. <laughs> Hillary, Hillary, let, let him land, then you can come back if you're not satisfied. We're also so building um, what we call technology resource centers. So this is another 42 of them. So if I'm a small business, let's say I want to buy a new um, processing for Gary, but I'm not sure where to get it to. You can go to these technology centers, link to Gratis. I don't know if any of you know Gratis is. Link to Gratis to provide that technology center. These are fully funded. They're being built as we speak. Um, at least 48 of the business resource centers have been built. Uh, the balance have been built. The technology, oh, I can give you a list if you want. 
No, no, we have that. No, but that is available. No, no, if it's not available, please go to... Um... <laughs> I think um, what they are saying is all these things are here. Getting to them is a different ball game. Yo, the website doesn't MBS do well. MBS aside. MBS. So how do they go on the website and even... So you go to the office, you sit there for what, what, a while, nobody attends to you. Um, to help you. If you give me a chance, I'll answer for you. Okay, please continue. I will ask the CEO of MBSSI to come here and come and answer some questions. <laughs> I'll ask her to come. Kosi will come with a team. But these are being built, and they're on the website. They're also on the Moti's website. We are building these. The president has commissioned at least seven, eight of them. All the balances are being built. These are being built. I have visited four or five of them myself. Um, tell me where you're from, and I'll tell you if there's one there. If you can take the microphone and yeah, do it ask, can, can we help him with the microphone? But I'm, I'm... A follow up to um, Mr. Hong Kong Linters. I'm sorry, Mr. Deputy Minister, I'm very sorry, but there is a culture of having to keep vital information from SMEs every time, and it's strategic for some strange reason. Yes, it is very possible, sir. Very, very, and I can tell you why. This NBSS, I went on the web, I have looked, I have searched. Where exactly? Where are the three buildings? There is nothing on the website. I live all the way at, at uh, Ebri. Okay, so I, I think we'll, we'll deal with this NBSS. Ah, hang on, hang people. on. There is no well, information. We have to move on with this here, one. We'll tell you the because very it's same just thing. a back and the forth. Things you said, no one knows. Guys, let's exercise restraint. We want answers to our questions. So, you know, let's take our time. Should, do you want to answer? Okay, so let me allow you to answer the questions, raise the comments, and then we'll come back to the, the questions. Alternative yeah. market. Okay, alternative somebody market. asked about uh, the Ghana Alternative Exchange. Can, can we please have some quiet? Thank you. Thank you. Somebody asked about the Ghana Alternative Exchange, which was set up, I believe, in 2013, I think. The Ghana Alternative Exchange is also another alternative uh, for raising equity capital. It was set up uh, with different rules and different requirements on the main exchange. So the, the rules and the requirements are very much relaxed. Um, you can get into GACs for almost nothing, or at, at almost no cost, in the sense that in addition to GACs, there is a, a, what they call a listing support fund. So the Ghana Stock Exchange will give you grant, grant money or loan money, which you pay back from you, the capital that you raise to help to pay for the expenses of going on the market, such as paying lawyers, paying investment bankers, promoting the issue, and so forth. So that's all available. Uh, but unfortunately, it hasn't been that well patronized. Since it was set up, maybe only about five companies have listed on GACs. And there's an interesting thing about the companies that have listed on GACs. Most of them came to GACs when they were distressed. So the, sh the shares have traded down there's no activity at all in the trading of those shares. And so the investors have also lost interest in GACs. But I, I think that the, the best type of company for GACs is company that has, fundam has uh, fundamental value. In other words, you go to GACs to grow and be more profitable, so you send a, a positive message to the market. You don't go to GACs when you've sat down and waited for so many years and your business is in distress. Otherwise, you will not even be able to raise the capital. I think some, some have attempted it and failed because they couldn't raise the capital. Okay. But it is an alternative. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's demanding in terms of the effort that you need to get on the, on the stock exchange through GACs because you have to hire lawyers, investment bankers, all kinds of service providers. But I think it's an alternative that, okay. that you can look at, yeah. Okay, let's take the next set of questions. No, I have, uh, let me respond. You didn't respond, okay. Um, the, the second question was on support system, and I want to just conduct a very quick test. How many of us here would like to invest in a business set up by a family member? 
if we can show by hands. <laughs> All right, so I, th I think we know the answer. It's so it's a cultural thing. It has got to do with trust. And I don't know whether we have answers to that, but I can tell you one thing. If you're an SME in a developed environment, I can use US as an example. One of your main sources of capital is family and friends. And sometimes you need only $5,000 to start a business. And there's an example that I always use where in about 15 years, a $5,000 startup turned into a $1.5 billion, no, a $15 billion business. And there's also another one, which is Beats, started in three years with almost nothing by the gentleman called uh, Dre, Dr. Dre. In three years, the value of that business was 4.3 billion US dollars. And then he sold it. So family and friends, it's an important source. I don't know whether it's going to work here. Um, so that's the response. I think um, the other one, there's a gentleman called David. Um, David, I think I want to have a discussion. Yeah, Edwin, right? I'll change it. Edwin, you want to know how much it will cost you if you came to us? I would say for the sake of this forum, it will be free for you. So contact me right after this. Okay, let's take the next set of questions quickly. My name is Hapi Akubi. Uh, having listened to the panel, I can see that the major problem that we are having, one is education, not education academically. But looking at our financial institutions, it seems they are interested in taking from us, but not giving to us. Because if they had to educate the SMEs about how to go about things, I don't think we will get to this point that we are. We are talking of record keeping and all those things. The banks, let's ask, how often do they even quarterly say we are organizing a conference for our clients? to educate them on some of the things that they are to do right. All that they are interested in is, oh, the guy is having money. Let's get to that guy and become a client to the bank. Some of the same way goes for Mr. Amkan Lindsay is here. Education, the same way. MBSSI, Kumar say, I called the line several times. It wasn't going through. I went to them and find out, and I was told, oh, the line is off for a very long time. I'm not in for that bunch or whatever. But what I'm saying is, let us educate ourselves. The websites that we have in Ghana for businesses, how many of them are updated every three months for us to have new information as to what is happening in the system? We are here talking about funding, funding. I wonder how many SMEs here knows about these platforms that we are talking of. Everything is centered in Accra. If you are outside Accra, problem. But we want to develop Ghana. These are the things we have to look at. And if we go on doing these things to ourselves, the foreigners that we are complaining about, they will take over. OK. Thank you. We have um, just about um, 15 minutes more to go. So make your um, question very short so that we can take all these hands up um, quickly. Yeah. Uh, my name is Edmond. Um, I just want to know, outside this forum, where we're getting some information at least, how can one get information? Like, I'm talking about um, venture, capital, and so on and so forth. Outside this forum, if I hadn't come here, and I just typed on my co computer, financing in Ghana, would I be able to get some information so that if I'm in Tamale or wherever, and I can't come here, I can still access this information and make a headway. And then also, um, startup companies, I seem to get the impression that it's uh, so difficult for them. Where can we get information for those who want to start up and don't even have tax records and stuff? You know how to go about it without coming to this forum. Okay. So one, the two gentlemen here, 
who is, there's a, the two hands here, and then there's, a, so six, then we move. There are two people here, we take theirs, we come here, here. Where's the microphone? Okay. Okay, my name is Sylvia. Mine is not a question, just a contribution. From all that we have gathered, um, and from my sister saying, and from my brother at the back, that there's doom and gloom. All I want to say is that there are certain things we cannot control, but there are some that we can control. As SMEs, we've talked about record keeping, we've talked about doing our things right, and the fact that some banks are not in the position to give funding to SMEs. It's just for one reason. We don't do our things right. A lot of us here as SMEs, we don't even run our bank accounts. Even the banks have difficulty in charging bank charge at the end of the month. We say all our money is on mobile money. How does a bank know that you exist if you don't run your account? Your mobile money can even be transferred onto your bank account. You can link it every day, whatever you collect. Transfer it into your bank. Let your bank see some activity. Keep records. A lot of us don't even pay SNET. We don't even pay PAYE. We don't record how much we have sold. Okay. We don't even know the difference between cash flows and our profits. So we go and buy land and all that. So for us as SMEs, what we take away from here is that let's do what we have to do. Forget about the government. Let's behave as if they don't exist. Let's build our business. Okay, thank for you, the madam. Next generation. Hello. You've asked the question already. Yes. But can so I let, let's give the opportunity okay. to those who haven't, please. I beg of you. Okay. Yeah. So my name is David, maybe the second David. Um, I think in your preliminary uh, comments, you said that um, if you get some loan from your husband, and I'm sure family and friends have mentioned uh, a lot of the times here, okay? And yes, obviously, those are the people who send their monies to the banks. But then the question is, I think it boils down to trust, okay? Now, can you also assume where taking the money from your husband, your husband says, let's sign a certain paper to indicate that my money is with you. I'm sure I your family sign. members will come in <laughs> to come and have conversations over conversations. But I think if we do them right, because that's, I mean, that's how it's supposed yeah. to, that's the right thing. So I am thinking that is something that we have to do. Okay. The other thing is to doctor. I'm sure um, Edwin asked the question, how much would it cost to consult you? And he said it's for free. So do we all get it for free? I'm sure he asked the question for the benefit of all of us. I think the first five. I'm begging of him to give the first five for free. Yeah, yeah, but, but, so but the question, five. I'm sure Edwin asked for all of us. So I'm sure it would serve us a lot of good if he says something. At least he can give us a range, if not specific. A discount Thank or you. something. OK, all right. Let, let's take one, two, then we take this side, then we move, we close. No. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Vivian. Um, I want to, uh, Mr. Honorable, please. Yes, uh, with your indulgence, I would like to uh, you, uh, address you. Uh, <laughs> Let's ask this question. <laughs> yes. So, um, good news. I heard you talk about funding for uh, what's it called, NBSSI, right? Yeah, so my, mine is a question. Um, can we change the narrative or the mindset a little bit? For the, the amount of money I hear you quoting that is going to uh, brick and mortar, I thought to myself, do we still need brick and mortar in the world in which we, we're going? That money can be used to you know, support <coughs> real enterprises. Why you just be, if you build a solid, a solid website backed by the, a very good call center, with a small team around it, you can use the money you are putting in brick and mortar for something else. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> all right. Thing. Secondly, a lady just mentioned uh, people are running their money on mobile money. So why can't the banks change their mindset? Mobile money has come to stay. And a lot, lot of people find it convenient to use mobile money. So if I'm running, some people spend 
maybe an average of uh, 2,000 every day on mobile money. Okay. Are you saying that man, because he doesn't have a you know, traditional bank account, is not... Okay, it's I think we get what you want to say. Thank so, you very much. Let's take this gentleman, then we move this way. Please make your comments, questions very short so that we can um, get everybody in. Then close. Yes, yeah. sir. Good, good afternoon, all. My name is Tony. Mine is about Agric, the value chain. And uh, I believe we are all here to have solution to our plight. Um, we do have a lot of um, organizations that bring in grants and things like the OVCF and other ones. But the problem here is you go try tapping funds from um, those organizations, then they will ask you to get support from the bank. And the bank will be looking at you as, an, as a farmer, that how are they going to mitigate the risk in being the vehicle or the funds manager for those funds? How are we going to go past that, that, that problem so that farmers can also get some grant as startups and then go into manufacturing of their own product? Because the poor farmer is always a poor farmer because someone somewhere being a middleman will capitalize on buying the stores from them and then adding money and then selling somewhere else and making a lot from their, their uh, sweat. So how can we go past that? Because a lot of grants comes to this country and it goes back. Why is it going back? It's going back because uh, we are not ticking the boxes and the banks are not ready to help us. Okay, Tony, we'll answer those questions when we do the agri uh, panel, which is the next one. No, after it, the it's also break. part of financing. Yes, it, it, I'm saying we'll touch on it further for you. He, he will deal with it, but you can get more answers to that. <laughs> Let's take it easy. Okay, Let's take this side and we close. Three more and then we end. Thank you. I wanted to answer the gentleman's question, why bricks and mortar? Let me explain a little bit, because you hear a little earlier, somebody said, but why do we have to bring everything to Accra? The Business Resource Center is to provide business resource advisory services in all 260 districts in our country. Not every part of the country has access to the level of IT. You may go to some places, there isn't even a place, even our senior high schools, they don't have computer rooms. So when you think of the Business Resource Center, think about a one-stop shop for business advice from all government agencies, from taxes to business registration to advice in one common building that gives you the resource. So that is why we are doing that. that. In that building, you can even have a computerized system that allows you to register online for your business services. So the reason why that has been done is for that specific purpose. In terms of then the capital to help, I just went on the MBSSI website. We have, for instance, Enable Youth programs with ADB that gives you training plus startups capital. That is provided through the BRCs. We have other programs. We have other small business loans. We have gratis-based loans. We even have Kaizen, which is part of the uh, working with the Japanese government to help continue to improve your working processes. But the only thing I want to try and um, emphasize on is not so much a question of we want to bring, build bricks and mortar just for the sake of it, but you have, the, have to have the infrastructure from which you can provide that services. One of the problems we have is many people tend to feel we have to come to Accra, and that doesn't help us. If I'm in Navarongo, Accra could be, I'm probably closer to uh, Wagadugu than I am to Accra. So we have to provide government services at the foot of the, the businesses. I wanted to just make a quick contribution. I came to question about funding and value chains. The gentleman on the phone. About your value chains. One of the most important reasons of having the 1D1F program is to ensure we put value chains closer to the farmer. So if I'm a tomato grower, if I'm a cashew nut grower, if I'm a cassava grower, if I am able to process my produce closer to my farm, there is less distance for middlemen or women. My colleague mentioned the Ghana Commodity Exchange. That is also designed to bring better farm price practices to the entity. To the finance, if I'm just um, cultivating two hectares or two acres of land, my ability to get finance for that may be limited because of scale. But if I'm part of a value chain where my two hectares or acres is part of a thousand that is feeding a, feeding a cassava manufacturing processing entity, the dynamics is very different. I can put myself into a group, some kind of a, a cooperative, 
and engage. These are all part of the economics of what we have to engage in. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ankuman. Let's take the final three and then we, we end. All right. Thank you. My name is George Adebuafo. Um, I'm here. We're all looking out for the solutions. And what pretty much sticks out is that we need to make funds available. All right. So, how do we do that? Um, we have credits in excess of about 25% if you want to assess um, from the banks. However, um, sorry, I, I missed your name. But yes, he said about 35% of the bank's funding is sitting with T bills. Now, we just recently did um, what do you call it? Capitalization, 400 million per bank. Now, these funds are supposed to be new funds that are coming in, new money coming into the system. If this new money is not being able um, to go to the SMEs or the private sector and goes in to sit with the Bank of Ghana or government of Ghana to get interest income of about 17% for one year um, bonds, 15% for 182, these are very comfortable. Okay. I mean, why would a bank lend to an SME which is likely to fail? at 28 and he will not, he's not going to get his money back if he can do 70%. He will do that one. So my point is that we need, as a matter of fact, an agency to bring down the rates. What are the options for the banks to invest in? Is that T-bills or credits? Okay. So, so if okay. T-bills is low, they have no option than to what? Finance their SMEs. Okay, thank you. Him and then we, we're done. And then him. My name is Isaac Folinsi. I want to ask how will you help the SMS for the tax that we have been paying to GRA? Because you pay the tax, they give you the tax current certificate, and it's like they will not give you the receipt. Most of them, you know, most of SMS are not educated. Even those who are educated, they are being cheated. So I just want to know how are you going to help for the tax that we have been paying to the government? I'm a victim myself. Okay. Last year, I paid 8000 I had a tax current certificate. No receipt was given to me. When I went there, they said I've not paid anything. <laughs> okay. All right. The final one. Thank you. Yes. We'll take the final one from the lady, I think, and then we're done. I've gone over my time. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to appreciate that this conversation is more progressive. So I think the reason why we have this forum is for us to find solutions to them. And um, just a few things. Earlier you mentioned some um, sources of funds. So one is invoice factoring, and then you mentioned crowdfunding. We have two startups in Ghana that I know of into one of these. So we have credits that's into crowdfunding for agribusinesses. And then we have invoice here, starting with an N, N-V-O-I-C-I-A. That is into invoice factoring for businesses. Okay. Now, knowing these companies, the challenge that they have currently is that they have a lot of requests and tickets, but the investment aspect is empty. So, um, as we have these platforms coming up, and we have startups also trying to solve the same financial challenge. Can we provide support for these people since you can't handle all at once? Another point is um, for the NBSSI, one thing that would work in addressing this is partnership. Not necessarily having fiscal facilities, but partnering with already existing institutions. For instance, if NBSSI does this with the consult together, so they can provide capacity building for SMEs that do not meet the requirements for funding. Okay. Then they could have access to it. So if it's possible, such a thing can happen. Another thing Yo, too is... We have to end it there. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> thank you. Let's take your um, answers and then we'll wrap up. We have, we've gone over 10 minutes. I can't go further. All right. Uh, in no particular order, but I think the one that excited me most is the question on funding for the agri sector. Um, do we have people from the insurance sector here? If we have insurance guys here, please, if you can show, if we have professionals, if you can show by hand. No, we, we don't. We have only one person. I can tell you what has worked in other countries. The mainstream banks would definitely not give money to 
the agri sector. They haven't done that in the past, and I can see that happen until something changes. For instance, they consider the agri sector to be very risky, and when they're giving money to farmers, for instance, it's difficult to cover their risk. What has happened in a place like Mexico is that they've come up with something called crop insurance. And what, what they do with crop insurance is that as long as you have the training and you're practicing what I would call good agri practices, if you have two acres of maize plantation, for instance, they have an idea how much your yield is going to be. With the insurance on it, financial institution discount, and then will give you uh, money ahead of your harvest. But the important thing is that we need the insurance sector to respond to that. I don't think they have, at this moment, developed that kind of product. So um, I think um, I would say city, uh, the, the city group should take this up with the insurance sector, following from this forum, and see whether they can learn from what has worked. Okay. Immediately they do that, I'm sure farmers practicing good you know, uh, agri practices will begin to have access to funding. Okay, thank you, Doug. Yeah, I'd like to respond to a few um, of the comments, questions. Um, there's actually an insurance company privately run that provides crop insurance. And it had to go through the trouble of um, convincing public sector that this is a product worth pursuing. The company is called World Cover, and it's done an excellent job at providing crop insurance. So. Uh, these are some of the innovative ways in which people are providing solutions. I think the last um, person who made a comment mentioned certain companies that we don't know about. And um, from an investor perspective, these are the companies I like to hear just so I can support for them to offer products and services to the mass market. Another comment that I want to make is I think City needs to do an MBSSI panel because um, it was mentioned um, quite a lot in this panel and they have a lot to offer to um, all of us. Um, Edmund asked the question about where do you get information? And I think the, the, the lack of symmetry or the information asymmetry is quite a problem, but I think GIPC is the main uh, stop for a lot of information gathering as well as providing data for some of these SMEs that are looking for investments. GIPC has a list of companies on their website as well as at the offices for companies looking for funding because it becomes the first stop for investors as well as foreign companies that are looking to start businesses. So it is very important that they add you know, requirements they add information or requirements for how to start a business in Ghana for Ghanaians. Sometimes the challenge is uh, we are too foreign oriented, but most of the money or most of the support may come from here. If we don't trust ourselves or if we don't support ourselves, then an outside investor is going to be less likely uh, to support us. Um, another person mentioned, I think it's David, digital platform, mobile money, wallets. We need, it's, a, it's another source of information sort of... Um, Law. It provides the security because your number, your, your cell number can provide the security to track you. So that we, we need investors who can develop micro products where um, people can use that as a crowdfunding platform or a source of funding for some of these SMEs. It is important that we find people to create the innovation, to create a product that can allow us to use our mobile money wallets to invest in other businesses. It is, it is, that would allow the micro industry, which has crumbled right now, to resuscitate itself. Overall, um, we work with a lot of data. And as much as we've been intense in our conversations, as much as we've been um, quite, you know, we've been quite provocative with our thoughts, et cetera, the this data actually shows that there's quite a lot of progress in Ghana. Most of the time, we don't see because we live here, but it's people who come out in and out that will tell you that, look, Ghana is doing well. Ghana is doing this, Ghana is doing that. I mean, we are constructively discontent, and it's good to be constructively, constructively discontent, which means that we are not satisfied with what, where we are. But then overall, we're doing okay. It could be better. 
and we need to push ourselves. It's good we pushed our public advocates to make sure that the right policies, the right incentives, as well as the institutions are functional. So I hope that you wouldn't leave here thinking that this was a waste. This was really important that we sat together and discuss access to finance, because okay. finance is oxygen for all our businesses. Thank okay. you. I just want to provide some information. And then for most of you, who are business owners, startups, and all that, and then you have business that has got to do with solar energy, um, smart agri, uh, waste management, and all that. There's an entity called the Ghana Climate Innovation Center. It's currently located on Ashesi campus. And what they do is that if you have a good business concept as a startup, they are ready to support you, I think, all the way to commercialization. And depending on how ready you are, you may be entitled to between a support of $5,000 all the way to $50,000. So if you are in any of those spaces, it's called Ghana Climate Innovation Center, located at, um, at Chelsea Campus. Okay. Try and see whether what you're doing fits into that, and then begin an engagement with them. Um, thank you. OK. Dr. Menzo, I have the final um, word. I think all the, all, the, all, all the points have been made, but I just I think one reminder uh, that we can take home is that, you know, the, the, we have mutual responsibilities on all sides. Government has responsibilities, businesses have responsibilities, banks have responsibilities, and we have to all work together to deal with the problems of access to finance. So let us see this as, not as us versus the banks, but it's all of us in this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to our gentlemen here. Dr. Bennett Spente, Dr. Sam Mensah, and Brian Achampo, thank you so very much. And thank you to you two. You've been fabulous. We have to end here. Um, snack is on our right side. If you come out of uh, this room on my right side. But um, the panel discussions continue. We have um, agriculture next. Um, sanitation um, runs concurrently with that. And um, we also have the entrepreneurial panel and then the uh, ministerial session. So please stay with us. And thank you so very much. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. Good afternoon. <laughs>